Greetings. I'm Rob Redden. I happen to be the minister for the Grove Beast Church of Christ. And if you have been listening to these uh, broadcasts, you will probably hear that every week. And you know that I live on the beautiful Central Coast in California. If you're in this area, we hope that you would visit our church family at 202 South, Grant, um, South 8th Street in beautiful Grover Beach. You know, we've all been going through some very difficult times for the last couple of years. The pandemic has struck us all, directly or indirectly. I'm sure most of us have lost friends, if not close loved ones. And uh, of course, it doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon. But the emotional, the physical, and the spiritual effects of this time is beyond measurement. Suicides are up. Murders are up. Criminal behavior is up. But this does not even come close to measuring all the tragedies that have happened and continue to happen, taxing our emotional, physical, and spiritual resources. And when we are occupied with all this, we wonder what Jesus really meant that he came to give us an abundant life. For he said in John 10, 10, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. New Living Translation says, my purpose is to give life in all its fullness. Now, he was talking more about life here and now as well as hereafter, and not just hereafter. Similarly, Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, 8, while bodily training or exercise is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds the promise for the present life and also the life to come. So Jesus is saying, along with Paul, that living the Christian life gives an abundant life. And what this means is not in the way the world measures that abundance. And we hope that this lesson can clarify that. You know, science has added years to our life, and we appreciate that. That we've been able to keep our loved ones a lot longer than would have happened, say, around the 20th century, turn of the 20th century. But the problem is that life, uh, science has not always added life to years. And we've seen those situations where it's unfortunate that lives, lives have been extended uh, beyond just breathing and heart beating. You know, the abundant life is not necessarily found in many years of life. I think about Methuselah living 969 years, and I'm thinking, Boy, what a legacy he left. And so I turned over there and read it again in Genesis 5. And what do I find? Just one thing mentioned about him. He, he fathered sons and daughters. I doubt it if you went to the, con, uh, um, the Library of Congress in D.C., one of the largest libraries in the country, and look up any works on Methuselah, I'm sure that you would have, have a hard time finding one, but that life lived 33 years. Very short for someone that has lived much longer. And you will discover more works written about that man than any historical figure ever recorded, ever lived. Reminds me of this poem. <clears throat> we live in deeds, not years, and thoughts, not breaths, and feelings, not figures on a dial. We should count time by heart throbs. He most lives 
who thinks most, feels noblest, and acts the best. You know, successful living is not necessarily dependent upon secular knowledge as well. Certainly, with information, we can certainly choose to live a better life. But that in and of itself will not give us the abundant life of fullness and richness that Jesus is talking about. Ecclesiastes 1.18, the Sol a wise man Solomon said, In much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. And much of the truth to that is seen in the responsibility that comes with that. But we ought to also understand that knowledge itself is not the source of one's abundant life. Caveat to that is the knowledge of Jesus Christ is. You know, Jesus said that the abundant life is not the accumulation of wealth. In Luke 12, 15, beware and be on guard against every form of greed or covetousness, for not even when one has the abundance does his life consist in possessions. Notice an emphasis upon form of greed. It shows up in so many different ways. You know, without a great sinner, the abundant life is just unavailable. The abundant life revolves around a great sinner. The story of Admiral Byrd is very interesting. Something happened during his first exploration of the South Pole. He said he had left his isolated hut one day for a brief uh, trip of exploration, and then suddenly a blizzard hit and he, lost, and he felt hopelessly lost. In the barren whiteness, there was nothing to give him any sense of direction. He knew if he would strike out blindly to find his hut, and if he failed, his chances of surviving would be almost nil. He had a long pole, which he always carried, to feel for holes in the ice. So he stuck it in the snow, put a scarf on it, and said, This is my center. If I fail to find my hut, I could return to the center and try again in a different direction. Three times, he said, I tried and failed, but each time I return to sinner and try again, saying, this is my sinner. If I fail to find my hut, I will return. Each time he returned to the sinner without having found his hut, he finally, finally went out and he realized this probably would be his last chance. And on the fourth attempt, he says, I stumbled upon my hut. If you don't have a great sinner for your life, you will be as hopeless as Admiral Byrd would have been had he not had that pole to become his sinner, to find his hut to live. You know, every life to be safe must have a sinner. A point of reference. There must be a home port, a place where we can return. In math, it's the decimal point. In grammar, it's, in literature, it's grammar. In life, it is God, and in particular, Jesus Christ. The hopeless people, those out on the streets, those that are struggling for their identity, don't have a sinner. Jesus Christ needs to be there. Paul said, in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ. That was his sinner. You know, it's said to err as human, to forgive is divine, but we've got to understand that to return to Christ is pardon. First John 1 and verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So Christ needs to be our sinner because he is the one that's going to forgive us of our sins. Abundant living requires us to be optimistic. And you may say, how can you be optimistic in a time like this? Well, Paul was in a time like his. 
And if you would read 2 Corinthians 4 and 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and see what that man went through and realize when he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, when he was in prison, we can't say just because we're living in this time that we can't be optimistic. You know, the pessimistic person says, if I don't try, I will never fail. But the optimist says, if I don't try, I will never succeed. Why should a Christian be optimistic? Well, certainly not because everything is predictable and pleasant. Paul didn't get his optimism from having perfect situation. But he did understand that he was part of the divine plan like you and I are. Ephesians 1, 3 through 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ Jesus with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. And his foreknowledge, he saw we would choose Christ. And because of that, he gives us every spiritual blessing we need. And we just mentioned Philippians 4, 3. But you know, Christ does empower the person who allows Christ to do it, who believes he will do it. This verse has been read so many times that I think the power has been minimized. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We need to allow Christ to knock the T out of I can't. And say, I can with Paul to do all things through him who strengthens me. Furthermore, we can be optimistic because God is for us. He's not against us. Some people think that God is hovering over them like a police officer ready to just pounce on them. But that's not our God. He loves us. He's pulling for us. Christ is. When Paul listed all those things that we have to struggle with in Romans 8, he says in verse 31, what then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If he's done the greatest, anything less than that is easy. Not that anything is hard or easy for God, but from our point of view. Optimism is very important. Now, let me ask you a question. Here's the test. Do you gripe because of the hole in the donut or do you enjoy the donut? There's a reason for that, but I won't go into that. You can Google it and find out why there's a hole in the donut. Is the glass half full or half empty? You know, the way you look at life will obviously determine your optimism. If you do not look at life through the lenses of Christ, it's hard to be optimistic. Furthermore, if our joy is made up from full fellowship with God's children, then we'll probably be optimistic. In 1 John 1, 3, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. That word fellowship is also a, a word that is often uh, said so much that the depth and meaning of it has been lost. And as a matter of fact, the word koinonia is, if it's not an English word now, coined from the Greek, I don't know why it hasn't been. But that word koinonia, fellowship, means a partnership, a camaraderie, a participation in, together together with one another. If you would just take your strongs down and look for the word fellowship and together, how it's used in the New Testament, and realize that practically every book in the New Testament were written to churches and very few to individuals, and those written to individuals affected the churches, you would see how important church worship, fellowship with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ is so important or are important because we are around the most optimistic people in the world. We are there for people pulling for us and we're there to pull for them as well. 
And so optimism is contagious. And if you're around optimistic people who are optimistic for the right reasons, it will rub off. It is contagious. But the abundant life is hesitant to find fault and to criticize. You know, the humble are conscious of their own faults and are more tolerant of the faults of others. And Jesus, of course, you said that you shouldn't look at the speck in your brother's eye when you have a log in your own. The fault finder condemns himself because through his criticisms of others. Romans 2, 1, therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you judge. You're the judge and practice the same things. O man is a clue that, it, uh, that he's referring to the Jews, Jewish Christians, who condemn the Gentiles who weren't like the Jewish Christians. But you know, on the other hand, we should never be discouraged when people find fault with us because we are not perfect and therefore we are easy targets because we try to claim to follow Jesus. But let's make sure we're not guilty of such a thing. You know, we need to be careful that we don't overreact to people who find fault with us, who belittle us, who may put us down, who may dislike us. We cannot please everyone. And it's very important for us not to allow somebody to pull our strings and we become just like them. In 1 Peter 3.17, it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. In other words, Jesus, uh, Peter is saying that Jesus wants us to be willing to be thick-skinned before the world and not have a knee-jerk response to every little bad thing that is said to us. We must make sure that we keep our criticisms and our lack of uh, kindness uh, in check and make sure that we are too not so easily manipulated by the fault finder as well. But the abundant life recognizes the other fellow has a point of view. You know, I've made it my practice. It wasn't true in my early years of ministry, but certainly in my later years of ministry, that regardless of the attitude of the person who criticizes me or offers a suggestion, regardless of what that person is or isn't, I'm going to look at it objectively. There may be some truth in the unkind way he presents it, or if he's joking, but yet under, underneath that joke is seriousness, I need to recognize that every fellow has a point of view. There was a Chinese delegate in New York who was asked by a reporter, what strikes you as one of the oddest things about Americans? And he replied, the particular slant of their eyes. Everybody has a point of view. And it doesn't make everybody wrong. It's just the way we see things. No pun intended. Oh, excuse me. Yes, there was a pun intended. So learning this lesson will help us to live easier and better with others and stay objective rather than pessimistic. I love this verse, Romans 14, 19. So then let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. This may mean I have to sacrifice my own whims and desires or my preferences and likes. It may mean that I just turn a deaf ear to some of the things that are said and, and a blind eye to the sum of the gestures and body language of other people. Of course, there are times when we have to confront that in a spirit of love to find out if we can resolve if there's a problem there. But we need to make it a goal to pursue things that make with, for peace and building up one another. People are not as mature or grown up in Christ as you and I may be. And we must accept them where they are. 
and help them rather than criticize them because they are not where we are spiritually. You know, this does not mean that we sanction other people's uh, bad behavior or neglect by changing God's will. Jesus recognized in the garden that there are some things you just can't change. And the will of God is one of them. And the abundant life means being able to admit wrong. <clears throat> when we're younger, our ego is in the, in the way. We have such fragile egos just to admit wrong may be just devastating to us. And children especially. Sometimes when they admit wrong, they would just break down and cry. But you know, when we are not able to admit wrong, we are actually not growing. <clears throat> are we wiser than we were the day before? We are if we admit wrong. You know, the world's greats made mistakes. Abraham made several mistakes. Moses, Peter, and Paul were in good company. The first step towards optimism, the abundant life, is to admit that we are human. Now, this is no excuse to not overcome our weaknesses. Hebrews chapter 12, putting away the sin that so often besets us. It doesn't excuse that behavior but it allows us to recognize that it's not going to, we're not going to allow that to rob the abundant life. A mission of sin is a necessary quality of the Christian life. We cannot avoid mistakes by doing nothing since that is also a grave mistake. James 4 and verse 17, the one who knows to do good and does it not to him, it is sin. And so the first thing we need to do here is Admit that we are at fault when we are at fault. Admit when we sin, when we do sin. Confess confess to the Lord, and he will forgive us. Speaking of forgiving, the abundant life means we are willing to forgive. Somebody says, well, I won't forgive until they come and ask for forgiveness. Depends on what it is. But the attitude of willingness to forgive is there. And if we maintain that attitude, we will not treat them with vengeance, with meanness, unkindness. If our attitude is, I won't have anything to do with them until they apologize, that's an arrogant attitude to have. You know, in Colossians 3.13, we are to bear with one another and if one has complained against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. The Lord doesn't want us to grovel forgiveness for forgiveness. He's already willing to forgive. When David was convicted of his sin and asked God to forgive him, Nathan said, God has already forgiven you because he saw his heart. Our willingness to must be God-like. In Matthew 6, 14 and 15, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. If you hold on to a wrong done you, you will suffer more than the person who did you wrong. And that person is controlling your life. The willingness to forgive is the one, one of the most releasing experience one can have. And finally, free and being free at last of that chain to somebody else who did you wrong. Have that willingness to forgive and treat them with forgiveness because that is important. And forgiveness leads to not holding a grudge. The Eskimos didn't have a word for forgiveness, so they made up one. And the English, in English, it's literally 
uh, thus, thusly given. No being able to think about it anymore. You think about that. Forgetting, as we talked about last week, is neglecting it, not giving it our attention, not allowing it to control us. I love the story of Joseph, one of my most favorite stories. And he was wrong deeply. But when he saw his brothers, or during that time apart from his brothers, we never read, I resent, I'm offended, I've taken exception, I've been mistreated, I've forgiven, but it's not forgotten. Why? Because ultimately he believed that God could even work through those bad experiences for God's purposes. Could it happen with us? Why not? Maybe it will help us with patience, tolerance, and understanding and develop the spirit of mercy. You say, you see, forgiveness is a matter of mercy and not justice. A mother who knew, his, uh, knew this sought pardon for his son from Napoleon. The emperor told her that this was his second offense and that he deserved to die. The mother replied, but I don't ask for justice. I plead for mercy. The emperor responded, he does not deserve mercy. The mother responded, sir, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. And mercy is all I ask for. Well, then responded Napoleon, I will have mercy and pardon your son. You know, during these hard times, it's difficult to not be fearful. But the more abundant life is unafraid. One of my favorite verses is 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. You know, our faith sustains us. And our hope serves as an anchor. In Hebrews 6.19, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner, inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. There's several things that we see here. Our hope is securely, firmly anchored in heaven where Jesus is. And he having gone as a forerunner guarantees that we will follow there to him in heaven. Why therefore should we be fearful when we realize that no matter how long our life here is, whether short or long, eternity will be better where there will be nothing that we have to wrestle with for the rest of eternity. That is comforting. You know, love casts out fear. In 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, but whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Remember the two greatest commandments. Love God with your whole being, and love your neighbor as yourself. And when you develop those virtues, fear dissipates. You know, the Lord wants us to live abundantly with God as our sinner. We will be secure. There is reason to be optimistic in all circumstances. While in a German concentration camp, Corey Tim Boom said to the young girl who complained about the lice, be thankful for the lice. It keeps the guards away from you. The abundant life does not guarantee an easy life from all forms of trouble and heartaches, but it does promise us strength to deal with it and the promise that it will make us stronger, wiser, and more holy. And we recognize we are imperfect and it makes it easier to accept others who are imperfect as well. And we become less critical and we are eager to confess our own wrongs and also a willingness to forgive a wrong suffered. Faith, hope, and love gives us courage to face life's challenges. And we need to trust in the source, 
sources of life's abundance instead of chasing the rainbow. Let us pray. Father in heaven, help us to understand that the abundant life is not a fleeting butterfly, but it's, but it's a sure and steadfast thing that can be grasped by the reaching. But we know, Heavenly Father, we must adjust our will to yours and recognize, dear God, that having done that, we will experience a joy and peace beyond comparison. Thank you for your promises. Through Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful day. And I urge you to gather with your church family and worship the Lord and give him glory and develop the optimism that comes from Christian fellowship. God bless you and God keep you until we meet again. Goodbye.